down that ray of literary criticism. It's a kind of a, not really a, a, it's the weeds, trust me. It is what it is. It is good news. Now, we can believe that it's both the beginning of the account, uh, the commencement of the story of Jesus, and we can also believe that it is the origin, the account of the way that the good news came to humanity at a specific time in human history, changing the course of human events in a most radical way imaginable. This is the beginning. To me, the good news that, that Mark is telling us about, it starts right here, in this place, right at the beginning of this book. Now, we talked about this. We did this for the Advent season. All of the birth stories, that's good stuff in Matthew and Luke. That's, that's, that's nice to, for us to look at. The way that John uh, writes his gospel, it takes us back to the very beginning you know, the, the beginning of everything, even before that. Those are good stories. They're beneficial stories. But they're all parts of the story that look back, that look to the past. They're not part of the looking forward part of the story. They're prologue. They're the back story. They kind of just, just get things going. They set us up and get us ready for this good news. Now, that's not to say that Mark doesn't do some of that. Mark does connect a little bit with the past. Uh, what's going on in the present time is connected to what happened in the past. That's where we are today. Jesus doesn't come into a chronological vacuum. Since God created humanity to exist in time, then God's plan for redemption is going to play out in time. And God's very aware of the fullness of time. And this particular character that we come across in this story, it serves as a bridge between the past, what happened back then, and the right now of Jesus. This is John the Baptist. Now, the way that Mark does this, the way that, that Mark connects the Jesus story to the past is to pull in some prophecy, to talk a little bit about what the prophets said. What Jesus is coming to do, it's connected to what God has been doing all along, and that's what the prophets were telling us about. And the prophets point forward to this anticipated figure, John the Baptist, as the one that prepares the way. This is what gets brought up again and again and again. This is what's happening in this first part of Mark's good news. It's preparation. I want to take a quick look at that. You got your Bibles open to Mark 1, right? Mark 1. So take a look at what is being said here. Now Mark attributes these prophetic pronouncements to the, the, the prophet Isaiah. But this is not a citation like we would do in a term paper these days. They're not concerned about footnotes or bibliographies or that kind of thing. Any, none of the biblical authors are really concerned about that. The quotation that you see there actually includes references to other biblical books, not just Isaiah the prophet. It, it, there's a little bit of Exodus in there. There's a little bit of Malachi in there. And it's the Malachi passage that I want to look at. That's, that's interesting to me. Okay, Isaiah... Isaiah, everybody likes Isaiah. You know, we, we've read multiple passages from Isaiah already. It's the classic, the traditional, the messianic prophet. When you hear about, when you hear Isaiah, it's all about God redeeming the people of God. Now, don't get me wrong. There's some other heavy stuff in there too. But most of the time, we bring forward those passages. It's about the end of oppression. It's about the release of the captive. It's a message of hope. That's what we really bring forward in, in Isaiah. This is what we think about when we think about the coming of the Messiah, the anointed one, hope. It is certainly what people in John the Baptist's day would have thought, that the Messiah was coming for a particular purpose, to get rid of the Romans, to end the oppression, to help things go the way they wanted them to go. But Mark's not going to let us get hung up on Isaiah. His inclusion of Malachi in this prophetic pronouncement that should give us pause. I want to invite you, if you want to, to turn to uh, Malachi chapter 3. That's where this quote comes from. Malachi 3, 1. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. Sounds familiar, just what Mark was saying. I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Now here's the, the interesting, maybe even troubling, part of this 
whole thing is that it's Malachi's words. They're not like Isaiah's. If you start to read further in this text, in this third chapter, you're going to see what I'm talking about. Isaiah gives people hope, says that the Messiah is coming, is going to set things right. It's, it's lifting up the downtrodden, but Malachi, no. Malachi is challenging the status quo. He's saying there's some, there's some serious stuff that you've got to be aware of here. Malachi is talking about the coming of the Lord who's going to refine with fire or fuller soap, who will draw near in judgment, who will bear witness against the sorcerer, the adulterer, the liar, the oppressor who cheats the worker out of his wages and persecutes the widow and the orphan. This is what the Lord is going to do when the Lord shows up. When the Lord comes... And there's a messenger that comes before him and prepares the way. The Lord's going to judge and prosecute the evildoer, the greedy, the one who withholds from the Lord, the one who speaks against the Lord. This is not a prophecy of freedom from oppression. This is a prophecy of doom. And Mark slots it right in there, right in the middle of what he's talking about when he's talking about John the Baptist. John's the one who prepares the way for the Lord's judgment, not just the Lord's liberation. Seriously, don't, don't read that Malachi passage unless you're ready to be challenged. There's some heavy stuff in there. Now, what John is saying starts to make a little more sense. His message of repentance, it starts to become a little more clear here. John brings to the foreground this Malachi passage, not so much the Isaiah passage. John is a prophet, like Malachi, preparing the way for the Lord's judgment. It's what we see in, in the other Gospels when, Mark, Mark, when, when, when John calls the crowd a, a brood of vipers, specifically the religious leaders, and, and warns them that the axe is at the root of the tree. He wants them to straighten up. He wants them to straighten up and fly right. He, he's clear that if they only look at Isaiah's prophecies, all the ones that talk about freedom from oppression that only celebrate the coming of the Lord, then they may be missing out on their own need to get ready to prepare. When the Messiah comes, when the Lord comes, there's going to be a reckoning. Things are going to be set right. And if there's not been obedience, if there's not been this faithfulness, then there's going to be consequences. But while John... The Baptist is definitely all in on this repentance message. That's where he's coming from. Mark, Mark may be saying something a little deeper and a little richer. John's message of repentance, even Malachi's message of repentance, it's not really at the heart of what Mark is trying to communicate. Yeah, we've got this, this prophecy, this composite prophecy, which offers both immense hope in the way that it references Isaiah, and something of a challenge when it references Malachi. And we've got this, this incredible singular figure, just, a, just a, an amazing person, this forerunner. He appears in the wilderness, and he's proclaiming this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And we see that it's, it's, it's hitting home for folks. And they're, they're coming out to hear him and to, and to follow through, to repent. This is an effective message. It's bearing fruit. It's hitting home. Mark is clear that John's supposed to be the representation of Elijah here, describing him wearing those clothes, the, the, the camel's hair and the leather belt. That's a callback to that great prophet. That was, that was Elijah's outfit. That's what he wore. And so the people were there. They were looking for this figure, this person, this, this, this character to show up in the story, and they were ready to respond. And they did respond. And repentance is a good message to proclaim. It's always a good message to proclaim, but it's not the good news. It's just the preparation for the good news. Verses 7 and 8, this is what I want you to look at. This is probably the most important part of this section that we're looking at today, the first part of Mark. It's the heart of what he wanted to say. Like we mentioned last week, John the Baptist is this incredibly charismatic figure. I mean, he is pretty awesome, really. I mean, you, you, you may not want to hang out with him on a weekend. <laughs> it might be a little bit heavy to do that with all the wild-eyed austerity and the fire and brimstone and, and 
You know, it's like I brought my own lunch of locusts and wild honey, so that kind of thing. But there's certainly something about him, something amazing about him. He is a powerful figure, particularly for folks that were anticipating just such a figure, who were ready for just such a figure to appear right before their liberation. This is what they were expecting. This is what they wanted. Now, it may be hyperbole. You may be overstating it, but Mark says that the people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people from Jerusalem, they all went out, all the city folks, all the country folks, everybody went out and they were responding to him and they were repenting and they were being baptized. And so John is this towering figure, casts a long shadow and it's easy for us to have our eyes drawn to him, get caught up in his charisma and his message. I don't want to say there's no need for this message. There certainly is. A message for repentance is always appropriate. There's a a continuing purpose to Malachi's words and to John's words and the warning of the coming refiner's fire and the judgment of the Lord, but I wonder if we get a little too caught up in that sometimes. Into the character of this forerunner, that 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 is a guy that is draws the eye for sure, and we miss the fact that he's just that. One who prepares the way. He is not the way himself he gets us ready for the good news he himself does not bring the good news he himself is not the good news the good news is this that that our sinful nature all these things that we need to repent of all the stuff that malachi was warning us about in his prophecy all the things that john was talking about all of that gets to be left behind that is part of the old life The old self, to introduce a little bit of Paul's thinking here, the good news is that a new life, a restored life can be realized finally. We tried so hard to do it on our own and we couldn't. Finally, now, we can receive this gift of grace from the good news himself, Jesus Christ. I touched on this last week, but I want to repeat it again today. John is part of this ancient prophetic tradition, stretches back centuries, a long and illustrious tradition that promises God's care for the oppressed and God's judgment on the oppressor. John's right in there. It's a tradition of, you better get yourself ready. You better get yourself right with the Lord. There's gonna be a reckoning. This is the message. And the prophets, up to and including John, consistently comforted the afflicted, and afflicted the comfortable. That's what they did. But there's this profound, eternally significant shift with John. John is the last. John is the last of these traditional prophets. Not because the message is meaningless. We keep reading it, and we keep hearing it, and we need to keep reading it and hearing it. Not because the message is meaningless, but because the thing that they were both warning us of and hoping for has finally happened. The Lord that they were getting us all ready for has finally come. Again, like I said last week, repentance without Jesus is meaningless. It's just one more ritual that we embrace. We do a little bit, We clean up for a while, and then we go right back to our old way of doing things. Repentance without Jesus is meaningless. You can can try. You can be like John. You can pour all the fire and brimstone on folks that you want. You can do it on yourself. But without Jesus, not a lick of it makes a difference. The good news that Mark is communicating here is that we're not stuck with just prophets anymore. That we don't have just prophets anymore. Somebody pointing out our failures, but not really offering us the way that we need to become what God wants us to be. They didn't have it. They couldn't have it any more than we could have it on our own. And John understood this. This is wonderful. The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I've baptized you with water. 
He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. As significant as John is, the one coming after him is so much more. For everything that he was, for every profound and powerful truth that he proclaimed, for every repentant heart that he inspired, it's all just water. And John got that. John knew, according to Mark, knew that what he was doing was ineffectual. That it would not have any internal significance without that more powerful one who came after him. His words, as needful as they might have been at the time, were nothing more than preparation. Getting ready. That way, prepared in the wilderness, made smooth, the royal road, fit for a coming king. The road itself is nothing. It is the king that travels on that road that is important. This, this, I think, is the central point of Mark's introduction here. I think that he wants us to see John, this powerful figure, cut from the cloth of Elijah, this wilderness prophet, the broad-shouldered and the burly, with all of his influence, all of his charisma, all of this energy that he brings to his, his ministry. Uh, Mark wants, to see, wants us to see him as, as relatively insignificant. I know, you're like, oh, oh my goodness, John the Baptist? Insignificant? That doesn't fit well, does it? That's not really how we think of him. But I think John himself would be fine with it. I think he'd be okay with that. John chapter 3, the gospel, the Baptist says there, no one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom, the one who stands near him and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. He must increase and I must decrease. That's John's perspective. That's how he thought of things. Now I want to be clear. This insignificance, this word that I used, it's a relative thing. All right? John's message is very important, still important, we still need to be prepared for Jesus. It's just that we have to be sure that we don't give John's message an outsized importance. Water is important, but the Holy Spirit is so much more. So much more. And Mark doesn't want us to spend too much time on anything that might draw our attention away from the one he's really talking about. The one whose story this is. John the Baptist is not the good news. Jesus is the good news. Which brings us back to Christmas traditions. In a sense, because he was a part of the Christmas story, reflecting on John the Baptist becomes a bit of a tradition. All right, we talked about John the Baptist last week. That was the final Sunday of Advent. He's, he's in there. He's in the story. We hear this message that he proclaims, a message of repentance. We might squirm a little bit if it's cutting a little too close to the bone where we need to hear a little bit about repentance if there's something we need to repent of more likely though we'll think of that other guy you know oh, well, I wish they were here to hear John's message that kind of thing they're the ones that need to deal with that but usually we take John the Baptist we box him up along with the angels and the shepherds and the rest of the nativity when January rolls around we forget, we forget that John's role is not to just play a temporary bit part in our annual Christmas pageant, but to get us ready for the life-changing and the constant truth of Emmanuel, God with us. God with us now, not then, now. John prepares us for this good news that we need. And according to Mark, the Baptist splashes some water in our faces and says, hey, wake up, you sleeper. The time is now. The time is now. The Lord is coming. And the Messiah has come. And is no tradition, something that we consider once in a while at regular intervals, whether they be annually or weekly, Jesus is an ever-present 
reality. This is the new life that we have been invited into whose gracious love finally makes that true repentance possible. Gives us the strength that we need to follow through on our commitments. Through the words of the forerunner John, Mark wants us to know who John is and who Jesus is. And he wants to know if we are ready for Jesus. Ready for Jesus to be our new reality. So are we ready? I want to invite you to take the prayer that's responsive prayer that's in your bulletins if you would bow your hearts as we share in this prayer together Lord God who are we that you would be mindful of us We go about our days with little thought for you. We take the parts of your word that we like and we neglect the rest. In countless ways, we fail to give you the whole of our lives. The prophets have reminded us that there is a price for our faithlessness, and yet we pretend that discipleship is cheap. Teach us, Lord, what an undivided heart is like. Help us by your grace to treat you as the most important part of us. Christmas is a reminder of the birth of your son, but it is not the birth of Jesus alone that matters. It is the life of Jesus, the way he illuminated your will, and the way he taught us what true faithfulness is. It is the life Jesus lived that we must live, a life holy and totally given to you, devoted to you above all else. And it is your spirit alone that makes this life possible if we choose it. Forgive us, Lord, our blind spots, that nugget of willfulness in our otherwise obedient hearts. Shine your light in the dark corners and equip us for more faithfulness every day. We pray in the name of the one who changed everything, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you would take your blue hymnals for our final song, I invite you to stand if you're able. 447 is the number if you want to sing the melodies and the harmonies. We'll do one, two, and four. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to
would bow with me once again. Lord, these are your people. These are your children. They have committed to you, and they are following as faithfully as they can. And Lord, we all stumble, and we all fall. We ask that you would forgive us when we do, and give us the strength that we need to be more faithful to you. Equip us for the fight. Lord, we ask that you would give us ample opportunity in the coming weeks to share your love, to help prepare people's hearts for the coming of the King. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.